Good morning. Uh, my name is Des Wilson. I'm the host of Black with COVID. And today we have a very special guest, a, a very renowned scholar, activist, and organizer in the Birmingham and uh, Southern uh, region and as a whole, uh, Mr. Martez Files. And before I bring him on, I'd like to play a short clip of Martez accepting uh, the Best Activist Award at the other awards, uh, I believe last year, uh, at Saturn in Birmingham. And the other awards is essentially a community uh, organized, a community organized event that uh, seeks to highlight and promote uh, community organizers and community um, uh, idols, essentially people who are working in the community uh, and acknowledge them for their efforts. And so this is Martez receiving the uh, other award for best activist. Folks who continue to do this work time and time again without recognition, without awards, folks in our community who do work that is consequential, that gets them in trouble, that gets them harmed, people who fight back against injustices, folks who are marginalized. I want to thank the women of Tate, Black Pearl, The Hub, all of the folks working to uh, fight against injustices in our city and fight for marginalized and oppressed folks. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, a little technical glitch. All right. And here we have uh, Dr. Mr. <laughs> Martez Files. How you doing, brother? Yes, I'm good. How are you, bro? And let me just go ahead and put this disclaimer out here, y'all. Uh, Martez is a, a personal friend of mine. I've known him for a few years. Uh, we met uh, in the Birmingham community. Uh, neither of us really even know how we met. We just yeah. kind of just became friends and, and it just kept rolling from there. Uh, but I've, I've I've known Martez for a few years and, and have always uh, recognized the work that he's been doing in the community. Um, right now, specifically, I know Tez, you've previously done one run of mental health kits for graduating seniors, and you're preparing to do another run. Uh, would you could you one tell us tell the viewers you know who you are, you know what your ethos is, and and, and what your your mission is? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Tez. I'm an activist, organizer, a scholar in the city of Birmingham. A lot of the work that I've done here uh, has centered around youth. Um, I'm definitely a youth advocate because I've been a teacher for so many years. Um, I'm also a scholar uh, finishing my doctoral research at UAB. And I do a lot of work around like police accountability, governmental accountability and community care. And so my e my ethos or my ethics in general center around uh, communal care, communal support for marginalized and vulnerable folks. Uh, so I I think the work that I've been trying to do with mental health though is one to push a conversation about mental health, right, and let folks know that not only is it okay to talk about mental health, it's also okay to get the help that you need. All right. And so that's that's the work that I've been trying to do uh, on the ground. The mental health kit initiative, though, uh, started because I was actually gifted uh, a mental health package by a woman named Chestoria uh, who sent me in the mail some teas and some some incense and some crystals. And she talked about how I needed to take care of myself in the same way that I was taking care of the community. Mm -hmm. That idea for me sparked. And I thought about what is it that these kids need right now, right? As they're fighting against the state and fighting against injustices on the ground, as they're fighting in their communities for resources, what it is do these youth need to do well? And that's where the idea for the mental health kits came from. And so, you know, the kids have things in them that help boost your serotonin, that help, you know, help you ground and center. There are things like stress balls and, you know, um, teas, honeys, essential oils, soft blankets and pillows, all of those things that we know uh, helps to uh, create a community of calm, of peace, of tranquility, all of that stuff is critical to the well-being of young folks. And so, yeah, that's, that's where that idea came from and that's the work. And Tez, your, uh, your passion uh, for being involved with helping uh, spread and increase awareness uh, for mental health in the black community um, stem partially from your own personal experience uh, with mental health issues and, and, and battles with mental health. Absolutely. Uh, I know you're a, a multifaceted scholar. Uh, I think you hold four different degrees and, and currently uh, finishing your PhD. Uh, yeah. Could you tell us, uh, you know, about, you know, what led you uh, to get involved with mental health uh, and also working with youth in general? Yeah, I think so. 
as, as you just noted, yeah. So there were some some things that I wasn't addressing with my own mental health, right? I felt like there was a way that if I just worked and if I ignored those things, if I just did the work, that my mental health challenges would dissipate and they would go away. And what I learned very quickly was the longer that I went without addressing those mental health challenges, the more helpless and hopeless I began to feel, right? And so, yeah, like a lot of my work uh, is, is is trauma work, right? Uh, in 2010, I was assaulted by Birmingham police officers in my own backyard. Um, and it, it kind of sparked me and pushed me into a police accountability work. But what folks miss when you're doing police accountability work or when you're doing governmental accountability work is the hits that you take, not only from racists and white supremacists, but also the hits you take sometime from folks in your community who are happy with the way that things are, right? And so I think I experienced burnout mm -hmm. and uh, what some folks call compassion fatigue. It's when you have an inability to care or to feel sorry because you've done so much care work mm -hmm. that you've exacerbated all your care. And so uh, I think that moment of recognizing that I was compassion fatigue, that I didn't care anymore, led me to know that I was in a crisis. Mm -hmm. So I went to go check myself in UAB um, and I contacted three of my friends and I said, hey, y'all, I'm checking myself into UAB because I'm literally having a breakdown. And when somebody can recognize they break down, psych, uh, psychologists and psychiatrists call that insight. And so insight is the ability to recognize one's own mental health issues and challenges. Mm -hmm. And because I am educated, I did have insight. I knew that something wasn't right. I knew that I was off. And so I went to go get help. Uh, when I went to the hospital, they wanted to hold me for 48 hours. I decided not to be healed. I decided to go to a therapist and talk. Um, and after talking to a thought, talk therapist, I was referred to a medical doctor who said, you, you may need to be tested for depression. Um, because a lot of what you're experiencing seems like hyperdepressive symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I, I was diagnosed with depression. I was prescribed a medication. And after two weeks of taking my medication, I, I began to feel exponentially better. Mm -hmm. Like I never knew that I could be as at peace as I was when I started taking medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and that was me getting the help I need. Right. Because I grew up in a community where folks said, you know, pray about it. You know, and I know that sounds stereotypical and a lot of folks say that, but I really did grow up in a climate where folks believed that you could pray away negative thoughts and, and negative energy. Mm -hmm. um, and what I had to learn very on is that, no, you have to set boundaries. You have to uh, recognize your own limitations. You have to learn to say no as a complete sentence. You have to go get the help that you need. You, if you need medication, you need to go do that. So all of that work is what made me. Uh, push a forward trajectory trying to address mental health in the larger community because I knew if I could be helped, others could be helped as well. And this was work you were doing prior to the pandemic, um, you know, shifting society and kind of normal life. How have you seen uh, mental health in the black community be affected since the shift with the pandemic? So I, uh, my boss, uh, Dr. Briggs, often talks about how we are living under multiple pandemics, right? So not just uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, but there's also uh, a pandemic uh, of, of racial reckoning happening in the United States as well, right? So folks are really starting to contend with all of the ways that inequality uh, and inequity has shaped and shifted policy, has shaped and shifted the way that we move through space and social interactions, etc. And so our kids feel all of that. Our kids are not immune from that, right? So yes, they recognize coronavirus. Yes, they recognize the pro police brutality that they're seeing. Yes, they recognize the governmental negligence that they're seeing. And so our kids are not dumb. Our kids need support. They don't have resources, right? But they do have information. They do have knowledge. And I think a part of what we have to do as adults is build community. So yes, this is work that I was doing uh, prior to, but it has drastically transformed since uh, COVID-19. My kids are at one point, they were all at home on shelter in place orders, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them at home without resources, some of them at home without lights, without water, without food. Some of them living in the black belt in areas where clean, where there is no availability of clean drinking water, mm -hmm. where hospitals are scant. So that even if, if some of them did get sick, they wouldn't have access to the medical care uh, that they needed to treat it. And so I've seen these kids fight to solve these problems on their own, right? Trying to find innovative solutions to problems that adults still have not found answers for. Mm. 
So I wanted to do the work of supporting them in that. So I started, you know, talking to youth advocates and other and other young folks who wanted to see change in their communities and asking them, what are the type of things that you need? And some of them have said things like housing. Some of them have said just a voice to talk to, somebody to vent to. All of those things I think are critical. And, I, and those things I believe are doable. I don't think that they're outside of the scope of what we're able to do. And uh, can you tell me some more about the work that you guys are doing uh, with Gear Up? Yeah. Uh, so uh, Gear Up is a uh, seven year grant that services uh, children in the Alabama Black Belt, almost 10,000 children in the Alabama Black Belt to prepare them for college and beyond. And so like I'm very lucky to work for Gear Up because I believe in the mission of Gear Up. I think Gear Up uh, is a program that has the potential to really transform the way that we've done schooling. Mm -hmm. um, because we provide multiple levels of support. Gear Up has done so much as take members from cities to the Black Belt so that they can see what folks' communities look like, so that they can meet people of the Black Belt, so they can learn ways that they can get plugged into that work. We've also done things like uh, uh, college tours and college fairs for those children in the Black Belt. We've done a lot of school and site visits. We've created rigorous uh, mentorship programming for them. Um, and we've also connected them with uh, four year colleges and two year universities. So the folks on those college and universities who could truly assist them and get in the resources that they need. All of those things have been central to the mission and the work. And so a, an extension of what I tried to do was because I am doing work in my nine to five capacity in the black belt is I wanted to extend the mental health initiative that I did in Birmingham City. Uh, with, you know, with the youth, the hundreds of youth that I did it here. And I wanted to do the same thing with a thousand children in the Alabama Black Belt, because I feel like those kids often get ignored. Mm -hmm. Nobody remembers that we have rural family, rural siblings, rural cousins out in the Black Belt who are fighting for limited resources, who are being denied access to health care. We, we are missing uh, the connection that we can make with our rural brothers and sisters and so that uh, and our rural siblings. And so that's the work that I wanted to do uh, outside of my capacity in my job. Mm. I know uh, graduating seniors have had it rough this year. A lot of them had to switch to virtual graduations. Yeah. Uh, I know some of them attempted to have in-person graduations. Um, how, how have you seen that strain on graduating seniors? I know this is an important time and transition for students going in into their first, you know, freshman years of college, they're yeah. not able to go and take the, the physical orientation tours on, on campus and um, enjoy some of those uh, th those joys of, of getting ready to start college. Have, have you seen that have an effect on these seniors and, and, and how do you think we remedy that? Yeah, uh, I mean, just like grown folks, youth are very diverse. So we've seen uh, so much as a group of children who felt that, that it was, it, it was, important for them to still experience graduation. They wanted to have a graduation ceremony, whether it was a large group gathering where all the schools graduated in, in places where they could social distance. And then there were another group of kids who felt like it was ridiculous in this moment to be trying to have graduation ceremonies with the pandemic going, right? So there was a wide spectrum of, of what they felt like they should do in this moment. Hmm. But what all of them agreed on was that graduation is important and it's mm -hmm. special and it's a time where they should be able to think about them their futures and 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 you know what their next steps are and so i've seen our kids struggle with what their transition looked like and i've seen mm -hmm. them feel helpless about the uncertainty that they're about to face mm -hmm. none of them know what college is going to look like uh, when they start in the fall mm -hmm. none of them none of my juniors know what their senior year of high school is about to look mm -hmm. like when they start school. Like, and all of our teachers are scrambling to learn new technology. Mm -hmm. They're scrambling to learn integration. They're scrambling to learn how to, you know, make their camera clear, how to make their voice clear, how to check chat rooms, etc. work that they haven't had to do. The, the pandemic forced us to become uh, technologically savvy and it forced us to adjust quickly. So folks who had kind of gotten set in their ways had their 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 that that disruption, right? It was disrupted. And so now we have kids who are adjusting with us. Mm -hmm. We're seeing work play out in real time. You know, a lot of folks have been tripping, saying everything keeps changing, everything keeps changing. But a part of what's happening is that regular folks are seeing the scientific method play out mm -hmm. in real time. 
right? Mm -hmm. so it's a theory. Yep. We ask a question. Mm -hmm. we, we we do a little research and we we, we do an experiment. Uh, some things work, some things don't, and we kick them out and we keep trying, right? We keep coming up with theories and questions, mm -hmm. and so we're seeing that play out in real time, and it's uncomfortable. It's an uncomfortable process because people want one singular answer for what we should do. And there is no one singular answer for what we do. The answer is that the work will be complex. The work will be multifaceted. The work will be challenging. No, you're not going to know what to do. No, you're not going to know how to teach in the fall. No, our children are not going to know what to do if they took ground classes and a kid got sick or their professor got sick or mm -hmm. entire class is sick. No, we not going to know. Right. But I do think what we can do is we can prepare ourselves to continually be adaptable. I think the best thing that we can offer in this moment is consistent adaptability, the ability to hear new information and to adjust our practices, the ability to recognize that the answers that we might that might have worked yesterday could possibly not work today. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need to be OK with that constant change. The only thing that is constant is change. And so. I think our kids are struggling with that, but I am certain that those kids are more prepared to face this challenge than their parents were, right? Mm. So I'm, I'm super inspired by Gen Z because they push me and they are brave and mm. talented and multifaceted. And so I think they're ready for whatever this, this thing throws at them. Yeah, I, I'm re really interested to see how this generation progresses. I mean, we know that they've had the pandemic thrown at them on top of you know, a, a much larger influx of technology uh, and access to technology than, than any previous generations. Uh, so seeing how they adapt to the use of technology uh, and also just how, you know, the, this entire pandemic has shown a light on some of the inequalities in our communities uh, from the healthcare system standpoint, but it's also making us reexamine how we teach, what we teach, you know, uh, it's, 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 make, it's shining a light on the workplace. You know, we're seeing that we don't have to have all these in-person meetings to yeah. be productive anymore. People don't have to have, you know, sit in a cubicle all day anymore. The effects that that's having on people's mental health and productivity. Uh, and so yeah. the, the gift inside of some of this is that it is finally putting a lot of this stuff on the table and providing yeah. real, real time examples of what it looks like Absolutely. in other forms and in other ways. And it's showing the workforce is showing the school system uh, that there are other options, you know, and uh, especially as we look as it relates to Gen Z uh, and these future generations, like you said, I, I mean, uh, the only thing constant is change Absolutely. and doing the same thing, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. Uh, in a lot of in a lot of cases, we're still applying the same solutions, expecting different results. And so um, one of the one of the, you know, benefits in this in this, you know, unfortunate scenario has been that it's, it's forced us to start looking at different solutions for these issues. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, protesting. You know, there's a lot of local and national protests happening right now. You mentioned the the, the triple dilemma we're faced uh, from a from a, uh, a health pandemic, a, a political pandemic. Uh, and I know you're a local uh, activist and organizer. You've worked with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, could you tell me what you know? What is the current state of protests? And what are some of those ongoing uh, demands that are being made? Um, right now in the country, um, as you know, uh, resi resistance in all in, in a number of different ways. We're seeing uh, folks who have progressive platforms. We're seeing them run for office. We're seeing our folks take to the streets and resist state violence at every turn. And, and a part of what that conversation really is, is, is hoping to spark is a revolution of the mind, right? A new way of thinking about the world, thinking about people and thinking about care, right? Who, who's labeled a criminal? Uh, and are our systems, we, we've created systems of punishment, but we haven't created mm. systems of healing and transformation mm. that we need to better societies, right? Mm. Jails and prisons don't do that. Mm. Jails and prisons don't transform society, mm. right? We, we try to get retribution and revenge. So when somebody does something that we don't like, we don't see it as a violation of relationship. We see it as a bad thing because you broke the law and the law is sovereign, mm. right? 
And I think we have to get to a place where we recognize that when stuff is happening, it's really a violation of relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So when the government doesn't meet to, meet its obligations to its people, it's a violation of relationships. When mm -hmm. police are violent and terroristic, as is the nature of their job, right? It's a violation of a relationship. And so a part of what we're seeing young folks call for is a, rest, a, a, a restoration of community. They, they want their communities to be healed. They want their communities to be safe, to not be hyper surveilled. They're asking for things like uh, oversight for the public. Uh, on, on, a, on a more uh, moderate level, uh, folks are asking for things like oversight boards uh, for the police. They're asking for a reduction in police budgets. They're asking for uh, bias training for police. And on, on, a more, on, a, on a more radical spectrum, folks are asking for the complete dismantlement of a system that they feel has failed them. And they're asking for a reinvention of, of methods. They want us to rethink how we handle people, right? Mm -hmm. Should someone who's having a mental health breakdown, should they be confronted by armed cops or should they be confronted by people who are trained in restraint, who are trained in uh, psychological evaluation, who are trained in care? And so they're asking you to make critical decisions about how city services are handled, right? Uh, we can't. We used to have this one size fit all. Send the cops uh, if a cat is in a tree. Send the cops if somebody having a mental health breakdown. Send the cops if 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 if, if, if my mama's sick. Send the cops if my baby crying, etc. And what what these young folks are saying is, the way that you have approached uh, issues, social, political, and economic in our community, has not worked, mm -hmm. and we need a reinvention of this system. And so I think that's what we're seeing on the streets. That's the resistance that we're seeing. That's the protest, right? Uh, things like releasing the video and being transparent, uh, like on a local level, releasing the video and being transparent about what happened to things like uh, what happened to folks like EJ or, you know, in other states, the folks uh, want the folks who killed Breonna Taylor to be held accountable for that. That is a reckoning. Right. That's our folks who have exacerbated all options. Mm. Right. And they feel that their only option left is to take to the streets. Right. Is to replace you um, in elect on, um, on Election Day. Um, and this is the work that we're seeing all across the country. Folks are tired and they want better and they're demanding better. And so I think it's 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 an exciting time for organizers who have been doing this work for a while. And I think for these youth, they are energized, they are charged up and they are not stopped. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the insight. Um, if you could tell me you, you're currently finishing your Ph.D., right? Yeah. What are you what are you studying? Uh, my doctorate is in educational studies in diverse populations. It's a concentration in metropolitan education studies. Essentially what my work looks at uh, or the re research that I do, I look at black mothering as an analytical flame framework, right? Black mothering uh, by all estimations is the mothering in general is the opposite of exploitation. So I try to find systems that push against explo exploitative systems, systems that challenge the entire use of a body without offering it anything in return. And, and so my work engages conversation around communal care. Mm -hmm. It engages conversations around community community accountability, because I truly believe that if we go to a framework of communal care and if we go to a framework of community accountability, that some of the problems that we see in government, some of the problems that we see in education, some of those, some of those problems would dissipate mm -hmm. because our aim as an individualistic capitalist society is to elevate self and to make as much for self as possible. Mm -hmm. And the, the faulty of that logic is that we miss that we exist in community with others and that we actually need community with others. And so when we exist in community with others, we have to be what's, what's called community accountable, mm -hmm. right? Which means that I honor space with Dez. Mm -hmm. which means that I would never do anything to violate the relationship that I have with this. And if I do, I want to atone for that. Mm -hmm. I want to apologize swiftly. I want to fight to make it right. And I also want to commit to this that I will be better. And so that's a framework that I adopted from mothering. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the framework that engages my research. So I look at mothering across urban, suburban and rural communities. Uh, and I search for models of communal care and mm -hmm. community accountability. Man, the work you're doing is amazing, man. I, I really appreciate uh, your dedication 
uh, to the community uh, and, and to these issues, uh, like you said. And I think uh, it's it's the the time is now uh, for these issues to be on the table, to be addressed. Uh, and and unfortunately, we're having to do it in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, but but we're doing it, and uh, we've seen our our state numbers start to slightly dip down. Um, you know, we want to encourage that even at the protest that people still continue to wear your mask and social distance, uh, and, and be reminded that we are still in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I know schools are having a shift to a lot of virtual classes. Uh, uh, be sure. Are there any resources or links you'd like to share uh, with people that are interested in getting to know more about you or Gear Up? or any other uh, initiatives that you're involved in? Yeah, you can follow at Gear Up Alabama, uh, at, at Gear Up a, uh, Alabama on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. Um, and if you want to learn about me, my Facebook page is public. Um, every post that I post is public. So you can type in my name, Martez Piles, on Facebook. Um, and literally, I, I am there. And uh, that's the work. And so, uh, I am excited to continue working in community with anybody who wants to do this work. If you want to connect and partner, let me know. Um, there's a lot to do. Um, and, and we're, we're excited to bring in new folks who are committed to justice and committed to bettering this work. There's, I appreciate you. This platform is incredible and I'm glad you built it out. Now, thank you, Taz. We'll definitely have you back on uh, here soon. Uh, again, this is Martez Files. Be sure to follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter to believe. Uh, at Martez Files and also uh, the organization that he's part of, Gear Up Alabama. They're doing a lot of great work in the community, uh, working with students. And if you are a student or a parent of a student or teacher of students, uh, Gear Up Alabama has a lot of resources available and programs that they're involved in and resources they provide back to the community. So please connect with them and, and lock in with what they're doing. Uh, Tez, thank you for taking the time out. And, and again, I'll definitely have you back on soon to check back in with you. Bro. Thank you, man. All right. Again, this is Black with COVID. I'm Des Wilson, the host. Uh, we'll be speaking with several different people in uh, various facets of, of community involvement and engagement from uh, healthcare to community organizers like Martez Files, who we just spoke with, uh, to teachers and parents here soon uh, around the, the adaptations that are having to be made for classrooms, for teaching, for at home teaching, um, as well as uh, mental health experts to talk about the uh, mental health stigmas and issues that are that everyone's being faced with uh, from the pandemic and from uh, dealing with the quarantine. And so we'll continue to uh, explore these issues as we move forward. If you have any questions, feel free to email me directly at dwilson at al.com uh, or feel free to hit my inbox or drop it in these comments. And again, this is Black with COVID. We'll be back here uh, next Monday at 11 a.m. on Reckon South.